Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxon. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. So on the show today, Krista Cocchioli probably pronounced that wrong again. <laughs> um, we're a new friends who we've met a few times. She's uh, living in Berlin and she's a dance therapist. She's training various people, long uh, community orientating kind of background as well, organizing, dancer, choreographer, well thought of in the conscious dance world actually is, is so super recommended to me and I've been enjoying to get to know her recently. So we'll continue that today. Krista, welcome. Yeah, hi. <laughs> what was the beginning of your journey? How did you get interested in working with the body? Well, um, I started dancing when I was three, <laughs> three years old. So the journey with the body began quite early. And at the, there was some point that I realized I felt more alive and felt more like I could connect more um, freely when I was moving. So the just was a no-brainer that it kept developing for me, that, that trying to understand why is it that I feel so free when I'm expressing myself in movement. Okay. And then as an adult, like what happened? You did a dance training, you you had some sort of trauma that made you want to do this for a living. Like what was what happened next? So little well, girl dancing around, what's next? Funny enough, I I was invited to a like a, a exhibition for different work in dance training or as 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 dancers, like a career fair. I think I was 14 or 15. And I actually went because there was going to be a guy from Broadway there. And I was thinking, oh, I'm going to be a Broadway dancer. And that's where I'm headed. And I was, I'm from upstate New York. And I thought New York is just calling me. You know, the stage is calling me. And there happened to be a movement therapist there. And she explained a little bit about her work. And she talked about um, communicating with teenagers through the body and expression. And it was at that moment I just said, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. Because um, I felt like in movement, in my body, I was able to connect with people in a really dramatically different way than when I was talking. Um, but I did go on to work on the stage and I, I studied psychology. So I, I was always going in between this continuum between the stage and um, psychiatric clinics. I was working a lot with adults and children in different settings. Um, and at some point I realized, hey, wait a minute, I can combine these two. So I was choreographing pieces around um, people's story. So I was giving like a, a moving chronicle to um, stories that I was hearing and experiencing with people. So it was kind of just this slowly emerging worlds. They felt really split in the beginning. And I'm talking about like in the 90s, you know, the 90s, it wasn't really uh, embodiment was... Not really so common. And when I was working in a psychiatric clinic in 93, I remember my boss saying to me, like, I really don't get what you're doing. Like, you're moving with these people. Um, but something's working. So we'll just keep doing it. And, yeah, so I just kept developing. So you've got to imagine most of the people listening to this are pretty bored into the idea. But let's imagine they weren't. Let's imagine, <laughs> that, you know, you're talking to that psychiatrist again, and he's like, hey, what are you doing? How would you how would you answer that to a, someone from the more kind of straight medical community, or in my case, business community? Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing that's a really uh, complex question that I always find it gets a little sticky answering. I'm just thinking about my who I'm talking to. Um, it, it's about really showing up to yourself um, by breathing, by sensing what impulses you're having. You're just becoming more. Um, alive and connected with what's happening. So what I'm doing is bringing that into movement. How, how am I bringing that out into the world? And, um, and since I'm working as a systems therapist, I'm looking at what, what, how does that influence the system around me or, or me as a system, body, mind, spirit, and then the systems around my relationship, my work. And so um, first connecting with the self, um, and then you could sort of see this as this unfolding of how, yeah, how am I moving space and connections around me. And you talk about systems work. So I, I, I've heard that term in a few different contexts. Could you explain what systems work is? It? 
Well, systems therapy is is always working um, in a context. We're always talking about or we're always exploring um, what that is relationship uh, relationship. <laughs> My English is kidding. <laughs> Thank you. I've been in Germany for uh, way too long. No. <laughs> Um, I guess to use a metaphor would make probably a lot more sense. It would be as if we were in a, like a family was in a car accident and the ambulance came and they only take the driver away. And a lot of therapies is, is, is doing just that. Like the person comes in with a crisis, they want to change something, we're just looking at the driver. But a systems therapist is looking at the whole context, the whole family, as it were. Okay. okay, I think this is dramatically underestimated that we're not just embodied, we're embodied in place. And we've, you know, we've had various people like Dr. Adrian Harris and, you know, Charles Eisenstein at the conference, like talking about how we're embodied in place. Mm -hmm. We're also always embodied in relationship, right? Like, like when people see me with my mentor, Paul Linden, or they see me with my niece, they see a whole nother side of my character. And like some of my students were shocked the other day because they, I was with my students. I'm normally quite kind of authoritarian and quite, you know, yang. And then my Aikido teacher was there, Maria. She's been my Aikido sensei for a long time or one of them. And I was really like deferential and humble to her. And my students were just like, what the fuck? And I'm like, yeah, because this is a different relationship, right? And it's like, like well, me and my wife, we're in a system together. So there's certain things I embody in that system. And there's certain things, that, things she takes on. So it's like when people change, you're also you're fucking with the system. So there's Absolutely. always resistance from other parts of that system because they're like, I'm working on, say, making a woman more confident, but her husband thinks that's his job. Absolutely. You got it. And the, the really cool thing about it is these systems are constantly in flux. So this humble um, part of you that you can show up to and really um, be in it with your sensei, you can also use it as a resource in, in other um, areas in your life. So they're not stuck. Mm -hmm. And what we, t we tend to do is get stuck in, yes. in different contexts. Like, okay, here I'm going to be, or the concept of myself is in this situation, I'm always this way, you know, in this situation, I'm always that way. So a system would be, um, or, or I find like it, it has to go through the body. I have to explore it with a body. I could talk to you for hours on end about cognitively restructuring how you see yourself in those systems. Mm -hmm. But once you start to embody it, you can see how you're bringing each, within each context you're bringing yourself. Yes. And you know what's funny is you can take the most shy, unconfident person and you'll say, okay, we're just playing a game, walking around the room. Okay, do a confident walk. And they'll be able to do a confident walk. So they, they actually can step into that, you know, embodiment. And because at some place in their life, they're confident, even if it's Absolutely. only one little, I'm just using confidence as a, an example that comes up. Like they already know how to embody confidence. They're already doing it somewhere or have at some time. So, and, and, and they can just do it. When you do the walk, they do it. Or the stand, they do it. They don't have to like think about it. I mean, you know, a little expert help can be helpful around some specifics, but generally they know it already. Absolutely. And that's part of our job is just to help people to remember that or maybe even to model it and then to let them try it out. Because we, we also, we need to learn in context or we're, we're capable to be in relation in order to move and explore. You know yes. I mean? It's the only way we can move beyond our, <laughs> the, 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 the thing that we understand to be ourselves. Mm. This idea of modeling is very interesting. So I've, I have a distinction of modeling versus outsourcing. So like I could look at my wife, gosh, she's way slower and calmer than me. And that's her job now. So I don't have to do that. Or I can look at my wife and go, wow, that's wonderful. She's kind of cat-like. How do I be, how do I find my inner Daria and actually use that as a way into my own range? Or some of my students, one of my students yesterday said to me, oh, I had to tell someone to fuck off. So I use my inner Mark Walsh. <laughs> and I can tell they just what a compliment. Her. I was like, yeah, great. I felt really happy. But it was, she was laughing because she was, she knew it was her. And she'd modeled that somehow. And a couple of years ago, she was a quiet little mouse. So it's like, you know, for her, that was a big deal. And she was just using me as a kind of um, a model. And it was her version of it, obviously. And she was laughing because she knew it was her and not me. You know, she's not like channeling me. So it's uh, like, is this your, your take on like this idea of we can role model and incorporate or we can outsource. So the system becomes 
almost enabling to our incompetence. It becomes, I've seen when people, for example, break up with a boyfriend or girlfriend, all of a sudden they realize they're utterly incompetent in some areas because the other person's been doing that in their system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they break up and they grow. Yeah. So what's your take on this difference between like role modeling versus um, having another part of the system do the work? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I would say this role modeling has also another dimension, the way I, I see it. It's, a, it's really about going into resonance with, with other people of, um, and, and having a trust in that. So you say that your inner Daria um, gets uh, fed when, when you see your wife. We, we have a way of um, shining different aspects of herself in other people. So if I'm in a situation where I'm working with somebody that's really stuck, mm. I'm getting also in myself, I'm getting in contact with that stuckness. So if I'm going to be a role model, I'm not going to say, Hey, yeah, let's, let's do it. Yeah, let's yeah. do it. So that's not first, right? Yeah. I, um, I have to stay in where I'm at in order to invite somebody to move out of the stuckness yes so i guess you could call it role modeling but i i if i'm working with somebody i'm really conscious of of having my shit together that i'm not i'm so you have to taste their stuff without drowning in it right like there has to be this like contact like hey i can kind of get in touch with my own stuckness but i'm not stuck right now Absolutely. and that's, a, that's like this fine dance isn't it between I'm touching where your sadness is, but I'm not becoming too depressed to actually coach you right now. That wouldn't be helpful. No, it wouldn't be helpful. <laughs> and you have two people that are depressed. What's the point? <laughs> two depressed people. I've seen that happen actually with some coaches that get caught by the clients. Um, okay, so let's talk about some of your specialisms and so psychiatric work. You're working in mental ill health. I am. What mm -hmm. particular areas that you're working with? Is it like anxiety, depression? I know you do a lot of work with trauma. I do, yeah, more, I guess trauma is more specialty and anxiety and depression um, is also uh, big up there. It's a day clinic in Berlin. It's, mm -hmm. a, um, it's a private clinic that I'm working in. So I'm also getting a certain group of people that are coming to me. They're quite in their network already. So it's not something like, you know, working with homeless people. I started working in New York in an emergency clinic with, you know. Yeah, you just got the middle class suffering now. So yeah. <laughs> how did you, let us just place you actually first, because you, your name sounds Italian, which I guess New York, that makes sense. And mm -hmm. you're now in Germany, like what, what happened there? You just, you just get tired of America or what happened? Well, Europe kind of happened to me. It was, um, yeah, 24 years ago. I've been now longer in Europe than in the U.S. And I just, I was on tour. And after the tour, I wanted to meet up with a friend in Berlin uh, that I knew from the States. And Berlin just was a wild time. 94 in Berlin. There's just so many things happening. Not long after the war fell. It was not so long after the war fell. And um, just people were gravitating here because this was an amazing city in flux, which is always has been, you know, it's always been the city kind of um, trying new things out and pulsating. Liberal, right. Let's just, cause you, to you, this is a given, but a lot of people don't know. People say Berlin, they think Hitler. But actually, Berlin was like the super hippie liberal capital that fucking Hitler hated. Like, like Berlin's always been this like super liberal, vibrant, slightly dark, decadent, hard drugs, kinky sex. I mean, Berlin is famous for these kind of scenes, right? The creative side. It's not as German as the rest of Germany. <laughs> Is, it's not Germany. It's all the hippies moved there exactly. to escape the military draft, right? Like yeah. all, the, all the West German hippies moved there to escape having to do national service. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And it, but even before the war, I mean, the Dadaism and Bauhaus and these, these amazing thinkers and also embodiment. I mean, look at it, the embodiment people yes. mostly came out of Berlin and then had to leave for lots of different reasons. Um, and it went all over the world. So we're talking about a place where just new thinking, it just seems to be this vortex of, of waking up and shaking things up. There's that history, isn't it? A lot of the Americans think embodiment started in the 60s in Ezalan. And actually there was a Western European, I mean, forget about the ancient Eastern traditions, but there was a Western European tradition coming out of 
Reich in Central Europe and a lot of the female dance movement therapists, like that was a whole thing in the sort of 20s, 30s and 40s. And, you know, really from the 40s, it had to kind of get out of town. But it's mm-hmm. like that was this was predating Ezalem by like 30, 40 years. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. And so Berlin at that time, like in the 90s, um, it was also the spirit of like, hey, OK, what are we going to do? And a lot of people just said, OK, look, at there's these empty houses. Let's make something out of it. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time or um, as my friend Adam Barley comedy said, you have a good nose. I had a good nose for um, things happening and shaking and got a, um, started with a, a big house project. And this was also a crazy time. It was like coming out of New York and just barely making it um, to pay my rent, you know, getting to Berlin. And there's this re- a huge house, uh, empty, and a bunch of artists and um more like in the Joseph Bowie's uh, direction as everyone's an artist and uh, the living plastic and this kind of crazy artist. Uh, let's make a living, a living artwork. It's called K77. And people could live pretty cheaply in Berlin, right? Because yeah, yeah. Housing that, situation. Well, not only that, the, this house that I'm talking about right now, it was, it was completely dilapidated and the German government gave us money to actually fix it up. Wow. Yeah, it was, I think it was a, a million and a half marks at, uh, at that time. What is that? What's that about a million euros? Like one and, mark's enough. Like yeah. A million marks, that would be a problem. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty awesome. And yeah, we had a dance studio. And we started exploring different ways of um, the embodiments, mostly contact scene, new dance, things like that. And that's where I also, you know, sort of did choreographing and just talking about uh, talking to people about this movement what was happening um the climate of berlin or the movement around berlin i started taking stories and putting them into to dance and eventually on stage and then also going back into um hospitals and opening up my private practice and it's, uh, it's, it's possible in Berlin. I have the feeling that some people ask me, could you be doing the work that you're doing in New York? And I really don't think so. I think the way the, the systems, bills. yeah, just to pay the bills, you yeah. have to kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. go into this one thing. And the most people that I um, am living, working with, have this kind of broader sense. They're in- incorporating lots of different passions in their lives and in interesting ways. Mm, mm. So tell us about some trauma. I'm, I'm particularly curious about your work in Bosnia. It sounds pretty hardcore. I'm not sure we need to trigger one in this or not. But uh, it, this was um, sounds fairly full on. Well, I I was quite naive when I think about it. It was <laughs> it was a good intention. No, um, it was in '94 as well. I came to Berlin and I um, met by chance my now husband. Uh, who started a project with Action Reconciliation um, Service for Peace in Mostar, which is a divided city as well, which is kind of interesting being in Berlin. That was a former divided city. Then we went to the divided city between Muslims and Croats. I worked in Nicosia, which is a divided city in Cyprus. There's something very unusual about divided cities that speaks psychologically to something kind of deep in ourselves, you know? Absolutely. Mm. Mm. Yeah. When was that? When were you there? Um, actually, it changed my life. It was, let's see, da, 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 just uh, 12 years ago, there was a Ike Extensions UN sponsored peace project, and that's where I met Strozzi, Don Levine, Paul Levi- uh, Miles Kessler, like all the people that became friends and mentors and kick started my whole kind of embodiment career. It was all in that one place, actually. So, um, yeah, there was a project with Aikido people coming together to do Aikido on, on the Green Line, which is like the no man's land in between the Turkish and the Greek side of Cyprus. And it was pretty intense and pretty special. And I was, I had time and none of the important people running at any time. So I became a sort of assistant manager and it was the first time I'd done a big project. I was thinking about it recently because the conference, you know, it felt like a, a different modern kind of fruition of the same thing. And we brought people together from all these war zones, like Israelis, Palestinians, Americans, Iraqis, Greeks, Turks, and they all came together and did Aikido, which is martial art, you know, it's just kind of ironic in the, in this kind of UN palace in the middle of, um, middle of this kind of no man's land, you know, 
pockmarked with kind of rocket propelled grenade scars and minefields and things. So this is pretty interesting. And I was up to that point, I was quite British and provincial and it opened my mind. And then from there, I kind of went around the world doing embodied stuff, basically. But that's my story anyway, not yours. Wow. So Fant- it's fascinating. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like being back, uh, I guess, 15 years earlier. So it's, I got my degree in the U S 92 and then I got a, um, you know, the specialized in trauma. And back then it was just such a new world. The trauma was not really, everyone kind of knew, okay, that's something to do with the body. How do we treat it? And it was kind of with kid gloves. So don't, don't, don't um, don't scare anybody, you know? So I have all this training, um, that I think I'm bringing with me to Bosnia and I get there and um, <laughs> it's everything but like the school books, you know, it's, um, it was towards the end of the war. So I'm not going to make it, it wasn't, uh, you know, the full on middle of the war, but we were in situations where it was unsafe sometimes or the power outages were going and, and I thought, okay, I have to just, throw everything out the window and I remember having I had just a couple books that I brought with me and one was um from Gabrielle Roth Maps to Ecstasy and um in that book she was also writing about her experience in um psych clinic so that was kind of supporting me in my journey of like what the hell am I doing and I started in a woman's center um on the Muslim side of of the city and it was quite a little tiny room and I said hey I'm here to move with you guys and they're all sitting with their cigarettes and shaking a little bit and drinking one coffee after another and everyone's kind of this nervous laughing and jabbering and I said yeah I'm, what do you guys think about two days a week I come in here for an hour and just we do some movement and the first week I started we were I think two women and myself and I basically just started with breathing just breathing and, and swaying a little bit just feeling the feet and these are people that were spending evenings in the bomb shelter or months maybe and you know people that have experienced way yeah things that we don't want to experience and so just breathing was really intense the second day I remember it being like maybe six or seven people and by two weeks I was in this tiny center and I had to stand on a table and people were outside it was there was two sides had windows and they were looking in the windows and doing the exercises with us and, and the big room was just filled I think there were 40 people or so and I was there for about a year and doing these kind of experimental is this sponsored by an NGO or are you just gone out there or I'm just trying to get a sense of the setup here? Well, it was a German organization called Reconciliation Service for Peace okay. and they were our hosts. And at that time, Hans, Hans Koschnik, who was a former mayor in Bremen, um, he was the European, uh, what was his, uh, was his position? He was a European person or contact and he really stood behind us um and supported us and we got funding from private donations we got some um funding from the eu and but i was getting like i think we got like 100 marks a month and it usually got stolen a day or two after it got yeah. <laughs> told I how that kind of work with the low money for <laughs> your profits and the weird <laughs> thing about the war in the former yugoslavia was it was in europe and like from Germany, it's not that far away. Mm-mm. I had British friends who drove there to deliver supplies and stuff, you know? Like you could literally, like we were used to watching war maybe on the television, Vietnam, Falklands, Africa somewhere. And then all of a sudden there was a war in Europe and it wasn't a nice war either. There was genocide, mass rapes, all sorts of heavy shit. And it was in Europe and it was weird. Like there was something like really disturbing about that. I, f- I felt like, okay, it was really timely that I came and, I, and the background that I had and the, um, the work that my um, husband, and Andreas Knod, wanted to um, implement with, with movement and with art therapies. 
I just felt like, okay, I, I got to go. But then I spent a couple of days in Berlin and I'm thinking, this is really crazy. Why would I be going to this place? And it was like this magnetic pull. I thought like, mm. I can't be in Europe and not go there. I can't. I, there was something mm. that it was so close and being maybe in the field, it's like the, the, the hippie dippy side of me. It's just felt like I'm in this field and I'm, I'm feeling Europe being... Um, so horribly treated there's, there's this pain and suffering going on and maybe i have a chance to offer something mm. Mm. yeah yeah the project is still going by the way it's still it's still happening the project which i'm quite proud of because a lot of these good initiatives died after right so the, the, people, what they, the real i think that to sort of actually to leave something behind is often the key thing with these things and not just drop in be a hero for a week or a year and then leave you know it's like this actually it's like can you actually build something that helps people um, no, we were we were really focused on getting local people to slowly take over the project so it wasn't like we pull out and then it's done. yeah right. i've been in those in africa um so, so what works with trauma then in your view because there's this view of like okay you have to sit in a room with a therapist for eight to ten sessions and often there just isn't the resources for stuff like that in those kind of places well, that's, in my opinion, that's where it starts to get shaky. You're sitting in a room with a therapist. Like, how uncomfortable is that? You know, mm -hmm. so just, <laughs> you're getting yourself more stuck into something. And, and like, literally parts of our brains, the, the part of our brain that's um, available for language shuts off when we're in trauma. So once we want to start talking about trauma, it's like we don't have the resources. Yes. To, yes. to talk about it. Excellent. So what needs to happen is have the body, you know, have other resources activated. And, um, and also this old idea um, yeah, that don't do anything that would, would make somebody upset, that would get somebody in distress. Mm -hmm. But the only way we're going to learn to heal, to self-heal, is to just keep stretching that window of tolerance. Mm -hmm. And I think through movement, you have a lot of more navigation skills to do that because I'm not talking about it. I'm, I'm in it. I'm in it. And I can sense, okay, this is what I can do. And again, going back to this idea of being in resonance with, with somebody. So I'm trying to sense, am I, am I jumping over that threshold right now when we're moving like this, or are we kind of stretching it now and just staying with, with something? And I think with breathing, you know, Whatever I do is we always start with the breath. Every session I do, we start with at least one minute with breathing, just sensing the breath, where you sense it, and then move from there. And this idea of window of tolerance may be new to some people. So as I understand it, the idea is there's a certain um, level of stimulation which we can handle. And if you go over that, people get overwhelmed. It's too much. People might be numb under a certain level. And that, that window gets narrowed by trauma. So people get numb, so they need to experience more to feel, but equally they can self-regulate less, so the sort of top side is going down as well. And it Excellent. ends up being basically like num, 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 freak out, becomes the sort of nervous system response. And gradually it's like sensitive, 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 and the top is self-regulate, self-regulate, self-regulate before they get, because everyone has a freak out point. You point enough guns at people, they freak out, I've found. Like mm. there's a freak out point. But it's like that window can be grown if we work skillfully within it. Is that your sense of that concept? I just want to make sure I'm not... Yep, exactly, exactly. Yep. I like to use the metaphor that I've um, borrowed from Babette Rothschild mm -hmm. um, when she says using the... Um, imagine a, a, a bottle of cola that's been shaken. Yes. It's been shaken for a long time. And we're, what I'm doing with um, the people that I'm working with is just learning different strategies of opening that lid on the cola so i don't want to open it like and <laughs> woof, freak out you know the cola's everywhere and then we have to clean up for a long time and whatever so there's some days that we're just going to go let that yeah. air out a little bit and there's some days we're going to open it really quick and then learn to and how do you cut do it again specifically what is the little bit of letting air out that's just like a little bit of breathing or feeling or moving or yeah exactly a little, a little bit of breathing it's breathing is always for me um needs to be at least an awareness of the breath in order to go for, forward. So I, I, I don't bring anybody into any kind of exercise if I don't have the sense they know where they're breathing or sensing they're breathing. So at least they... That, they're holding their breath, that's, that's already too much. That's right. 
So if they could sense themselves holding their breath, they're already a step further in their healing process. Got so, it. Got it. So that's already there. That's at least sensing. They're at least aware that they're honing it. Mm -hmm. if, by the way, if you do want to traumatize a group of embodiment teachers, just bring a can of Coke in. Like if you wanted a cola model, like a can of Coke will always upset yoga teachers, conscious dance teachers. <laughs> You crack open a can of Coke in fire rhythms, you get all kinds of trauma reactions. It's hilarious. <laughs> but that's a different uh, color. Yeah, it is definitely different. But I did have that uh, in the summer. It was so hot here in Berlin. And I, I just had this desire for a Coke. And I coke in my hand and I ran into a patient. And she said, oh, Miss Cacioli, you're drinking a Coke? Yes. And I, think, I think she was upset for about a week about like this. I actually, crack, yeah. You know, like... <laughs> Someone exactly. said to me, I thought you were an embodiment teacher in this exact same situation, being like caught drinking a Coke. I'm like, caught, exactly. Have a sugary. No, it's more along the lines like I was giving crack to babies on the corner yes. or something. That's what she was really upset about this. Listeners, just notice your trauma response when we're talking about the sweet, sweet taste of American captain. Oh my God. So, um, okay, so Coca Cola trauma, stuff for trauma. That's good. <laughs> So you did some stuff in Bosnia and then you came back to Berlin. Yep. So I came back to Berlin and I um, sort of picked up with that work here, working with refugees because there was tons and tons and tons of refugees here in Berlin. And um, yeah, then I started working in this private clinic, which is a, a different atmosphere as in Bosnia. <laughs> and um, different groups, huh? <laughs> that's a different group. And I have two teenage boys at home. And when the Syrian crisis started a couple of years ago, I really sat down with my husband and we thought, okay, what are we going to do to support the situation, to give our expertise? Because he and I have so, so many years experience. And, um, and I realized this doesn't make sense to go into these homes again or even i'm i had a sense of going to aleppo like i'm just thinking okay i'm going to go to greece or and work with the people um lesbos and then i realized wait a minute that's kind of um wasting all of this experience i have 24 years of experience working with refugees why don't i train the trainer yes so what i'm doing now is i volunteer um and i also teach workshops and courses for people that are working with refugees I, I'm actually going into schools now. I'm teaching teachers how to regulate themselves and how then to regulate their classrooms. Because what's happening is you have the, my son has 32 kids in their class. And in some of the schools, there's maybe four or five that are traumatized. From, yes. And the teacher does, has absolutely no skills of how to run a class you know with somebody that's obviously having a really difficult time so this is this old buddhist story of like there's a guy standing by a river and someone flows by the river and he's he's drowning and she jumps in and he saves the guy and he goes back to fishing yeah. and another guy is drowning and he jumps in and he saves him and goes back and the third guy's in and this time he just runs up the stream to find out who's pushing everyone in the river you know, it's like, Smart man. <laughs> like, like you, go, you know what I mean? Like rather than trying to save everyone or maybe he trains a lifeguard instead is you know, that maybe a better analogy for, you know, this work. And there's a certain point where you go, you know, I'm going to stop trying to save everyone myself. And I'm actually going to maybe pass this knowledge on to other people or look at things a bit deeper. Yeah. I so wished that I had somebody to give me some pointers on self-regulation before I went to Bosnia. And I know that um, some of the people that I work with took their, took their own lives yes. or had years and years of struggling with um, what we experienced. So I feel like it's kind of my duty, if I can say that, it's, like it's my duty to, to what I know now can pass it on. And like what you just said 12 years ago, look at the difference between 12 years ago and 24 years ago of going into a conflict zone. Like people bringing that knowledge and the way to work with people with trauma is just so yes. different. It was, yeah, for me, 13 years ago in Cyprus, and I spent three years working in areas of conflict. And even though I had a psychology degree and some embodiment skills from Aikido and different other things, you know, I actually, after three years, I was totally burnt out, alcoholic, suicidal, like you had had friends who were you know, drug addicted, suicides, etc. And I saw the refugee camps um, that, that I'd been around were, const were absolutely full of aid workers who had sex addictions, drug addictions, you know, all sorts of problems. And it was just clear that people weren't handling that well. And I, I ended up doing some training just a few years back for a bunch of humanitarian organizations on trauma awareness 
Um, so some major ones actually in Britain, like Save the Children or Oxfam and War Child. And it was still new. And I was like, really? You work in the worst places on earth. Like I, I was literally, it was like me and then some super kids would be sent to Congo, you know? And it was like last stop before hell was training with Mark. And, <laughs> it was, and I'd be like, all right, I've got three days and you're a naive 21 year old water sanitation worker yeah. and you're about to be sent to DRC. And I go, okay, but that's better than nothing. Cause I had nothing. Like it's better to have that three days of at least training. And there's a weird denial in that whole field. It can be very macho, the humanitarian field, lots of ex-military and a sort of macho denial of any kind of, I mean, psychologically, I think the, the vulnerability gets projected upon the poor brown people of wherever, you know? So mm. there's a sort of disowning of one's own vulnerability and a projection onto this sort of um, the people that the NGO workers are trying to save. So it's a very interesting psychology in the nonprofit. I- uh, it, absolutely. I mean, this is this is ma- really major extreme cases. What we're we're talking about war zones. It's not too many people are working in war zones. But when I think about even um, coaches or doctors, like uh, my cousin who's an oncologist, um, who daily needs to tell people really, really shitty news. Yes. After what what kind of training did you get in your medicine studies? Nothing. There was nothing, nothing, maybe like an hour it was mentioned. Maybe you should take care of yourself after having to talk about this. So I'm still feeling like um, there's an awareness with us, like people working with embodiment. This is, this needs to be out there, but teachers and and coaches and anybody working with anybody. (laughs) Yeah. Like a nurse, a policeman, like anyone that's around hardcore shit on a daily basis. There's quite a lot of occupations, you know, life and death stuff. And you know, I wonder if we're reaching a sort of tipping point with trauma awareness because, you know, Freud talked about repetition compulsion years ago, you know, all the Jews who are moving to Berlin right now, you know, there's all kinds of kind of weird patterns playing out in that. But it's like, this is this, some of this knowledge has been around a while. And certainly the embodied version of this has been around a good kind of 20 years and people Levine and Bocelli and people like that, you know, and um, I wonder now though, if it's starting to become well enough known outside, like it seems like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when Paul Linden first mentioned trauma work to me, it was a minority thing. And now it's quite a big thing. And I, I wonder if enough people are becoming aware of this kind of field that for the first time really in human history, it will become, if not common knowledge, certainly common knowledge of anyone working in relevant fields. Uh, yeah, I have to agree. I think it's becoming common knowledge and also this whole new neuroscience that's opening up about epigen- epigenetics. It's not just a hippy-dippy thing with karma, but we actually are able to see in our genes uh, yes. traumas of our ancestors. There's some so, studies, isn't there, of ancestors of Holocaust survivors and things like this, yeah? Absolutely. Really um, mind-blowing, and it's just in the beginning. So we're just at the precipice of, of this new um, knowledge. The thing is, I have people coming to me um, or I've, I'm invited to give talks or workshops where people say, okay, we know that this this is common knowledge. I know I need to be um, better skilled with my own um, trauma or, my, or, or what my triggers are, but how, what do I do? How, how do I go? And, and um, not everybody needs to do a trauma therapy um, training. I think um, it just needs to start to be incorporated with, within. Every yoga course, every therapy course. Every, I was talking to the, the head of the International Coach Federation in the UK today, and I, I said, do, you know, why isn't trauma part of just the coach's training like mm-hmm. just a couple of days of trauma education into the training or for yoga teachers it should absolutely just be like a couple of days of educational work in there all the even if i'm not going to become a therapist for me it's like okay i have trauma i've been in trauma you know i've dealt with a lot of it the work continues and as someone who works with people i want to keep looking at that mm-hmm. like even just doing my own work let, let alone trying to educate anyone else yeah I think there's a really big um, need and desire to to have forums and platforms to talk about this. Uh, in fact, this might be a good uh, <laughs> bridge to our talk about the embodiment circles. Um, we met for the opening of your beautiful, wonderful, successful embodiment conference uh, in Berlin. And it was just 
really people for, that I had never met or maybe saw their name on Facebook. And we, we said, hey, let's meet up and see each other live and check out the conference. And with our discussion about what's going on in Berlin and how we can support each other, the biggest question or the biggest desire from everybody working there, there were, just, there were researchers, there were um, massage therapists, people working with sex, sex, sexological body work, um, movement therapists, dancers, yoga teachers, you name it. Um, and they all said, we want to know more about trauma and embodiment. So could that be our next or our first official embodiment circle? Berlin meetup will be, um, I'll be talking about that. Just what I think. There's a hunger for it, isn't there? There's, there's definitely a hunger for it. And there's, there's a need. If trauma is in the title, the podcast gets twice as many downloads. Really? Yep. That's interesting. Yep. Because I, like I said, and people. Sex and trauma. They're the two words. <laughs> <laughs> what about rock and roll? Should we add rock and roll in there? You no, know, I'm not sure. <laughs> and rock and roll. We could, we could. <laughs> that could be your next podcast. Boom. Bestseller <laughs> right there. Best, like <laughs> off the charts bestseller. Yeah. No, I just, I feel like there needs to be sort of trauma 101 things out there available because people say, oh, trauma, okay, you need to go to this trauma expert and whatever. And I think that if we just start to become aware of how we are settling into our bodies, how do we land with our own triggers like we can support other people and i think just having that discussion will hopefully give people the support or maybe even um the courage to intuitively work with people that well, what i was them. saying to the coach federation i was saying listen you don't have to become a therapist this is just going to make you a better trainer to know about the basics here and actually the base like i do a one hour talk for my embodied yoga teachers and like the difference between nothing and like one hour of kind of concise, clear teaching is quite a big difference in terms of their understanding, their compassion, you know, and just being better teachers. So mm. you know, I feel like, I feel like even the basics get a lot. And uh, increasingly, I think it will just become part of how we educate people in all fields. And it's natural that therapists lead the way because they're dealing with the most traumatized people. And mm. then, you know, after that, it will be the, the embodiment people. And after that, it will be the coaches and the yoga teachers. And after that, it will be the school teachers and the nurses. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I can see it spreading. And this is actually, I've talked about this in some of the other podcasts. It's actually getting to a point where I worry the word is being devalued and everyone's traumatized by, you know, by having a can of Coke or anything else, you know? Yeah, I think there definitely has to be a new um, discussion about the definition of trauma. You know, what, what, what is exactly trauma? And, um, Trauma is anything that the body can't um, can't handle, you know, can at that moment. But there's also the just degree of trauma of you know, there's just a huge continuum of what trauma is. And I think people become this kind of word. <laughs> it's a mysterious word. We need to talk about that again. I'm upset. You know, to some other people, it means like. Like, can we really put you being annoyed by someone's politics in the same box as a, I don't know, gang rape? I mean, do we really want to put those in the same category? Like, it seems to me like that's a little dangerous. In the Absolutely. I, I feel like the word, like, system overload or so should come in there. It's nervous like system. <laughs> like, Ari Lyon talks about this nervous system education. Like, Absolutely. So much yeah. cleaner in some ways. She's just talking about nervous systems and how nervous systems work and how they get mm -hmm. overloaded and how they build charge and discharge and it just it's because otherwise it's like this very hardcore word you know and it gets people's backs up if so if, if you said to me mark you traumatized me i'd be like whoa okay you know that's pretty heavy you know am i going to jail mm. whereas if you said like you know mark i'm a bit upset and i know it's some kind of jangled right now in my nervous system i'm like okay i can i can help with that let's work mm -hmm. with that. absolutely and and you know how how often i have patients who um a huge part of the therapy, at least in the, in the beginning, is getting over the guilt of not being able to deal with something. Or some people will really say, I don't know why mm -hmm. I feel this way. You know, and it could be this raging, horrific um, childhood experience, but they don't want to call it trauma because they think, oh, I, I don't really have a trauma. The trauma is something yeah. different. You know, so there's so many words and self-definitions and issues around yeah, so I really would love to have it named something like nervous system 
uh, challenge or something like that. Right. I'm having a nervous system challenge right now, or I was challenged as yeah. a child in my nervous system. Um, something triggers, like the word triggers got a bad name. The word trauma. Trigger, so yeah. It's like it's all getting overdone. And I never thought I'd say that because like 10 years ago after the sort of waking up to this a little bit with Paul and other people, I was like, felt like a voice in the wilderness. I'd see some behavior and I just, well, obviously Israelis are hyper aroused as a people because they have trauma from their history. Well, obviously, you know, Russians don't smile because they're numb and they've closed down their eyes. And it was just things that were really obvious to me and no one else was getting. And it was just, unless they were a trauma therapist, it just seemed like, just so obvious and now it's the opposite like i got here's a, a similar example i started getting annoyed last night with headspace meditation adverts interrupting my youtube viewing <laughs> and i never thought in a million years when i started meditating whatever many years 15 20 years ago i never thought i'd get to the point where i'd be annoyed by adverts for meditation apps on my phone like, because the first time I saw a Headspace app, I was like, Headspace advert. I was like, that's so cool. Meditation's become so popular that it's it's even got adverts now. Wow, that's amazing. And literally, I was so annoyed last night, you know? So, Welcome to the 21st century. <laughs> maybe embodiment will get like that. Not another embodiment center, you know? But that's what it will come like. Uh, well, here in Berlin, in every corner, there's a yoga studio. It's, it's like, oh, yeah. Like we need another yoga studio. It well, is. It yoga's is the precursor. Yoga's like the the harbinger of embodied doom. You know, like yoga's yoga's like the the vanguard, like outrider of embodiment. Is how I see it. You know, <laughs> this is like yoga comes first, and everything else follows. So often when I'm working with like high profile managers, whatever, whatever, I can't say I'm a movement therapist. I'm not yeah. going to say oh, you know we're going to work this way. I say, well, it's kind of like yoga but we're off the mat we're moving <laughs> off the mat <laughs> principles that's the route i went down yeah. and that's okay and people get it like oh yeah okay yoga off the mat or yeah. how, how can i use yoga in my daily life and and that works and and i'm i'm not ashamed to say i use that as the explanation because you know people understand yoga or it's kind of a given people do yoga anyone who's anyone does yoga or oh, knows what yoga is, is. Right? My niece said, what kind of yoga do you do? do How old is she? Uh, she's seven. No. <laughs> she assumed I did some kind of yoga. She's like, do you do slow yoga like granny or like hot yoga like mummy? And, and, then, <laughs> and then she found out her dad didn't do yoga. And she was like, why? We thought that was the weirdest thing. But he didn't so do we're going to have these new names instead of digital native. We're going to have the yoga natives. Embodiment yeah. natives. The embodiment. Oh, wouldn't that be awesome? But here's the thing. Oh, like, that would be beautiful. Yoga, mindfulness, embodiment. Now I'm explaining embodiment through yoga, through mindfulness. Now that's normalized. I think conscious dance is going to come next. I think that's not far behind. There's a sort of big movement. Mm -hmm. you, know, you already see these like sober morning raves in London and this kind of thing. So I wonder, you know, it's not so practical because it takes more space and there's a bit more of a barrier to entry and it looks a bit weirder. But actually yoga looked pretty weird. So maybe that's not really a barrier. Like I wonder like if embodiment's time isn't sort of coming, you know? I am totally uh, with you on that. I think that movement, because yoga has, has now, well, at least in Berlin, the yoga studios that I go to, Sometimes there's such a dogma and such strictness, and and so I'm I'm just doing more of the same that I'm trying to That's get exactly out of. What Berlin hippies need. Yeah, right. No. <laughs> but movement, conscious movement, and um, rediscovering myself in every moment, and, and what I can do on the dance floor. That's just, it's just you can't get that anywhere else, or you can't feel that embodiment. Um, I find in other practices. I'm definitely into the conscious movement. <laughs> uh, movement is a nice term because it's not too weird a word. You know, like this term came out of the conference, the movement movement, which it, it turned out Gary Carter and some other people had used before in the 80s around some more physical practices. And I talked to Gary and he, we had this weird misunderstanding. So he was like, I invented that. I was like, what? No, you didn't. And then we realized, oh, we're talking at cross purposes because he'd used the term previously. But anyway, this term movement, movement came out of the conference. And it, the reason the conference was so successful wasn't just that Daniela and myself and Arabella and all the others did a good job. The reason it was so successful is because the time was right. Like 
the reason we had 15,000 people and the Facebook ads were getting people and the rest of it wasn't some marketing genius. It was just that it just feels like the world is ripe for it. Mm. And this idea came out of the comments. Like I, I thought I was running a little conference and then I thought I was running a big conference. And then there was a shift about halfway through and you, you and me saw it early and then it kind of shifted. Like as we talked about it, like as the conference was starting and then by a week in, it was obvious something was happening that was a bit different. Like there's a movement movement in the world. There's an embodiment thrust that's coming through all of society right now. And I don't know if it's because American politics has got bad enough or right. refugee crisis. <laughs> like there's something fucked up enough that like this, this movement is coming through and all the disciplines are talking to each other now. On, you know, the yogi is also dancing for the first time. The martial artists know what Feldenkrais is. Uh, Alexander Technique teachers might actually do some meditation as well. And, like something's going on with that. And that to me was a fascinating phenomenon. Well, I can just to tell you a little bit about my journey with this. Uh, um, it, it in fact started <laughs> in November, two years ago, when Trump was elected. I remember I, I woke, I, I didn't even let, wait to the results here, you know, six six hours later, because I knew this can't be that he's going to be elected. So when I woke up in the morning and I needed to teach a workshop that day and I turned on the radio and he was really elected. And I think I taught a day workshop completely dissociated and I fell into a crisis. Like I had, I, I, did, I couldn't go to work for about a week. I was, I was immobilized. I thought, how can I work with people with depression when I myself are, am absolutely question humanity and I did a lot of um, talking with a friend of mine Alex Pota who's a German living in the U.S. doing also life coaching stuff his take on things he's also a community organizer and me being here and came to the conclusions like all of this shit I've been working on with myself and my work and developing mm -hmm. is coming now to <laughs> the point but now we have to use it yeah like now this is time, and that's why I coined the term radical presence, moving with playful compassion. And that's what I, I call my work because it's like I cannot, humanity cannot sit back and see how the things are going to develop. It's, yes. not, it's not, we're not in that situation anymore. We're way beyond that. Yes. So we have this emergent model and nobody knows how it's going to go and nobody knows what's happening. But all of a sudden we have this, if we want to use the, the feminine archetype. We have this way of learning together that's this feminine archetype of, okay, I'm including you. Hey, wait a minute, you're doing something similar to, my, to me in a totally different field. Let's learn from each other. Let's help each other out. Let's, you know, because we can't do it the way we did it in the 90s. Okay, a few things I want to want to add in here. Um, Please. If I may, yeah. So it's the feminine thing, right? You're going to call it something. Not yet, different. not yet. So um, <laughs> that, that we'll come to that. Um, so first of all, I, I feel like, like this is a shock of like, seriously? Trump, like before Bush was bad, right? And Brexit, like more friends, was like, seriously? It was like this slap to the face that a fucking trickle-down embodiment model, a trickle-down spiritual model, model, just hadn't worked. It was like, hang on a minute, most of the population is still voting for something which <laughs> just is kind of hard to understand. Makes like, no sense. Like, <laughs> bubbles in Berlin and Brighton and Boulder, Colorado and Byron Bay, we don't fucking realize. And it's like this thing we've been doing isn't accessible. It hasn't reached enough people. And there was this sense of urgency that came with that. And as you say, like I spoke to my friend Damien earlier, who's running a um, big center of personal growth in London. And we're planning this big project together. I've started dreaming much bigger since the conference. And, and we were like, what the hell have we done 20 years of personal growth for? Exactly. Like, what have mm. we done it for? Just mm. to masturbate with crystals? To like, prepare us for this moment. <laughs> to prepare us for exactly this moment. To get Last piece. Last piece. There. The other piece I'd say <laughs> is that the liberals, including myself up to recently, I would have put myself in that box, are partly responsible for the denial of money, sex, and power. There's the shadow of Trump. And by denying power, we gave power to others. By denying money, we gave wealth to others. And by having this slightly weird relationship to sex, that's coming out in all sorts of funny ways. So like when Trump was elected, I, I blame the American left as much as the American right. Yeah. 
I think we're, if I respond on this, we're going to be opening up a huge. <laughs> what I would love, <laughs> love, 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 love. Yeah, we we this, is, this is what I'm calling radical presence. This is exactly it. It's, it's to own my power and own my sexuality and to be responsible for that, for, for sensing it and then taking action. Because this is, yeah, I agree with you. I feel like this is as much um, a problem from the liberal party as from the right party that we we saw this going on for years i mean look at Berlusconi; he was elected time and time again we knew that these kind of people had in power europe, in europe the, the 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 far left said open borders and then that created a reaction from the far right right like the lack of boundaries and edge and borders from in germany and sweden and all those other places and then there's this kickback from eastern europe where they go no fuck off we're not doing it and their, their over boundaries come in as a result of the under boundaries of the left. So, I mean, if we take a model, for, say, from Peter Levine, this this pendulating, you know, we've we've done this for a long time, and right now, I I feel like we're now getting to a point where we're smart enough and we know enough information, and we have the urgency, like you said, we we don't, you know. The, the the planet is not going to survive the way we are treating it. So we're we're moving into the space where we need to start moving. Um, I, I guess you can't see me with a podcast, and then we use a model with my hands. I'm Italian. I got to talk with my hands. <laughs> um, so we're pendulating more, we're swinging closely or closer with each other. We got to get out of this flip flopping. Extremes are very um, dangerous, aren't they? They're so dangerous on either edge. And this one reactionary. Um, behavior you know it's just this is what got us here yeah place. well you know before nazi germany it was a weimar republic so that was like super liberal super open so uh whenever i see germany swing to this super liberal side i always have a slight cautionary in breath you know but uh maybe it's happening on a more global scale listen let's talk about the circles because we don't have a huge amount of time and this is the thing that brought us together, right? We, you were make, you, know, you got people together for a party when the conference launched in Berlin, and there was this urge to connect. And a lot of these isolated teachers with different schools were wanting to get together. And both, and I really saw there were several things happening. Like people wanted to connect because they felt lonely, and they wanted to connect because they wanted to learn. And peer learning seems to be a kind of more of the keeping rather than guru learning like top-down learning, it feels like peer learning is becoming a thing now in a, in a radical way. And the third thing I saw is that people wanted to, like, like a lot of people in this area were broke and they were wanting, you know, talk about reclaiming power and money. Th there was this people sort of saying, listen, I'm a good person. I've done good things. I've worked in Bosnia or Africa or whatever, and I'm tired of being broke and I've got bills to pay. And they were the three sort of listenings that I heard. You know, this, this sense of connection, this need for learning and this sense of like, okay, how do we actually support ourselves, make a good living do this? Mm -hmm. and, I just step back for a second, because right? I had the feeling already in Berlin, there was these groups gestating. Yes. There was already like in the open floor, um, a group, a, a network starting or in the five rhythms, a group um, of teachers started networking um, um, I had gotten my radical presence of getting people on board to get a, a group of coaches. And so there were all these kind of small little circles already happening. So I think it was something magically timed about the conference. And I um, just sort of Stuart put the names together and I was like, wow, I know all of these, but I know a lot of these people. So why not just meet instead of, you know, be involved uh, just online. So there was anything, there was an atmosphere that, of people really, really wanting to do these three things that you just named yes. and, um, and how to do it. And we've, we've been kind of playing around in Facebook worlds and um, it just, I think showing up is just such a different you know feeling what? than I, being in a Facebook group. We found online there was a sense of connection that could be got that was profound. And I know people listen to this podcast, they really feel like they know me. When I meet them, they invite me into their houses, they talk to me about their personal life because they really feel like they know me from this podcast, which in a way they do because I'm very honest and they're getting an embodied sense of me. And online we found with the conference people could connect way deeper than we imagined in these Zoom groups. You know, We were really shocked by um, how deeply people connected. And you want to hug your friends. Absolutely. You want to get together locally. 
So, so they, we've kind of created this idea of this sort of global movement called the embodiment circle because it's global and it's connected online in these ways. I was just last night Zoom calling, you know, 10 different yoga teacher friends and students of mine from about five different countries, three continents. So it's possible to connect online. But then there's also this longing to know who your neighbors are. Like, I don't know the name of the people that live above and below me in my apartment, you know? And it's like, like I can go online and do a think Facebook live for 200 people, but can I get five people in the pub this evening? You know, like that's crazy. So, so I feel like in the same way as even though we live like, you know, bookshops are more popular than ever. Why? Because in a digital age, people want to feel a book and they want to smell it. And I feel like this is the way real community and, and, and connection will happen. It's not to degrade the online connection because that, you know, simultaneously I'm thinking online is deeper than I thought. And it's different and there's certain needs that don't get fulfilled through the, this, the local community aspect. Mm. I would use that model again, what we're talking about pendulating. I think the, the further we go out, like I had breakout rooms with people from India and uh, it was amazing. Oh, right. I, had really, yeah. I loved the breakout rooms. I had no <laughs> idea that I was going to be able to go so deep. And, like, that was weeks. the most popular thing about the conference. That people, was so cool. It was so cool. Some people didn't listen to the speakers. They just came for the breakout rooms. <laughs> <laughs> the breakout junkies <laughs> but the more we can we're connected you know we're, we're, and we're going way out there the more we need to have yeah that touch and say and, and, and be in somebody's um in 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 the presence of somebody i think that's it's like the yin yang of our embodiment work and, and i think we're so expansive right now and the possibilities are endless how we can connect with people and work with people i'm just reading a thread that you put up maybe yesterday about different embodiment practices online, what people say, what, what their experiences have been. And I was like, what authentic movement online? Or <laughs> TRE online? Cool. Are you serious? I, I get focusing lessons online and I listen to Feldenkrais from recordings and my therapist yeah. only ever phones me. I see him maybe once every few months in person. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm doing a lot online and then, but I was shocked when I started to see authentic movement, open floor, and I think there's going to be a conscious, just between me and you, I think there's going to be, uh, we're, we're talking about tech X's. So you know how Ted X's? Oh, be cool. Probably TEDx. going to be a conscious okay. dance one. Like, I'll make sure you get an invitation. Excellent. And, and, there's, there's, and I thought, and, there's, and the other one is the intimacy and tantra one that's going to happen. Ah, online. Online, really? Okay. really? okay, but yeah, but just take that, for example. What good is tantra? online if i don't have a place to practice it in my yes. real life like i just to give you an antidote i i do my talks with patients in the beginning so talking about embodiment what the relationship is to their body and to other people and a lot of times people say oh i have a lot of friends i'm really well networked and i would ask them okay so what do you do to your social network what are what are some of your activities and like yeah well I've got a thousand friends on Facebook or <laughs> like this young guy recently told me he's been going out with this woman for two years and we're starting to talk in, about his relationship and I'm, I'm asking him all these kind of questions. And then he says, you know, I never really met her. I never met her in person. Right. Yeah. I met people in Japan who had virtual boyfriends and girlfriends like computer programs. And that's the extreme in Japan. If you want to see the extreme of this connection, just go to Japan. And I've, I've definitely met younger people, I mean, early 20s, that have lack, lack of social and relational skills because of, because of some of this stuff. And again, without disrespect to them, because I do love the online format. And, you know, like how many friends you've got is how many people you can call at three in the morning to cry on their shoulder, right? And go around the house. Like mm. that's how many friends you've got. Like how many people do I know in Brighton who I can call at three in the morning and say, hey, I need a friend right now. Uh, can I come to your house? And like, that's four or five, that's not 5,000. So like, I think there's really something for those local links. Um, you know, we're having a meal with um, the EFC community Christmas kind of meal after a training tomorrow. And there's people coming from all over Europe and, and England for this, for this Christmas meal. Why? Because sitting and breaking bread together doesn't get old. Even 2000, 2000, where are we? I forget what year we're in because I'm always planning ahead. 2018, it's like, I feel like it's 2019 because I'm planning all, year, all that year. Even in 2018, it doesn't get old to break bread with other people, right? That's hmm. really healing to be with other people. So it's, it's this idea of being in resonance with other people 
just I, I, maybe at some point I'll get to that point where I can be online. I'm not I'm not as hmm. often online. You know, the the conference was kind of a new intensity for me as it got to another level. But I don't think I can get that electromagnetic feels, you know, that you sense when you're ne next to somebody that you really trust and you're feeling warm and cozy with. And it's just, it's different. It's different. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've used social media very heavily and I, I now can't read a book. So I've lost some skills, but I've also, I experience it as a layer of embodiment that's constantly present. So there's, so I think there's another kind of embodiment that's going to happen. <laughs> So it makes me think that like, the further we go out, the more disciplined we need to be to go in. So maybe you are out there with um, online stuff and you're really, really far out there, but you have a lot of skills to keep you anchored and to keep you yeah, in your center. You know, yeah. so you, I and think also at 6 a.m. this morning, I'm sitting meditating with myself in the dark on my own, getting present. At 7.30 a.m., I'm with a group of alcoholic men, that I, most of whom I've known for 10 years, making the tea do you know what i mean so there's this i feel like we need to be able to operate at these levels like internally relationally and wide and virtual and not replacing one with the other yeah i see this really is a, a problem with my 12 and 14 year old at home like they're so in that virtual world and i'm, I'm I'm grateful that they're doing sports so often, but I think when to lose that skill, or I, I know so many patients that come to us that they, they've never learned that skill of going in, you know, that you can actually get so rusty that it starts to shrivel in your brain. This, yes. the, the insula, you know, it, the insula can actually shrivel. Wow. And deplete. Yeah. Um, Schnarch is doing a lot of studies about this. It would be interesting. This is the place of, of going inside, um, can just wither and we need to it, the further we go out the more we need to go in and the further we go in the more we need to go out because we all know those guru types meditating five uh five hours a day or these uh three day fasters i'm having a curry with my colleague a real human being in in two hours and 15 minutes, okay? Oh, that's um, not a way to break a fast. <laughs> totally <laughs> is. In the loop, oh, baby. God. Oh, my God. <laughs> my fast consists of coffee and water as well. People get upset by that. Uh, like, oh, okay, you, you have a Mark Walsh fast. It's a Mark Walsh fast. That's right. Okay. So, <laughs> so, what are we talking about? My, we my started show. with the, the environment so, circles. We're talking about the timeliness in Berlin and how this group kind of... Um, yeah, it's pulsating. It's awesome. Um, Tamara Romulik, I hope I'm saying her name right, from the Open Floor community. I had already set up a page called Embodied Berlin. She already had contacts going, and it was great. She put together uh, an event, and we had a woman at the first meeting that uh, works for a, quite a big dance studio, and she said, oh, I'll hook you up with a space. Unfortunately, it's a space that's only for 20 people, and we've been booked out for about a week in the meetings wow. in two weeks. Wow, you're going to have yeah. to make another one. And, so, and there's about, just to, for people out there, we'll release this podcast quite quickly so people can find out. Like, if you go to Facebook and you look up Embodiment Circle and put a city in, one may well come up. There's at least 50 now. By the time this goes live, there might be 70. Uh, it's an open source idea. So the, the idea is it doesn't take a personality or a guru or even a teacher like us to, to run it because it's a structure. It's just like it's based loosely on a 12 step kind of model where the structure does the heavy lifting mm. and there's, there's certain principles, there's certain like guidelines, like no one style takes over and it's not for profit, but what the, there's also regional variation so people are running them in different ways and different styles it's not centrally controlled by me or you or anyone else which is radical right it's not a business it's not made it's you know everyone profits no but it's no one's business is one of the taglines and it's I like that mm -hmm. yeah it's nicer huh? so it's and it's no one's in charge this is a, such a radical idea like I, you know we started it and now it's spreading and mm. the community are voting on logos for example i didn't choose the logo that was voted for like this isn't being run like a dictatorship or a business and it's it's very interesting to me that, that this this model which is 
in some ways old, like 12 step have used it for years, but it's, it's come of age now. I think it's the time where people no longer want an empire. They no longer want Patabi Joyce abusing people. Mm. They, they, they're wanting something peer to peer. I mean, it's very German in that way, you know. Yeah, flat hierarchies. I mean, we're done with this phallic hierarchy system. Well, already. that's the feminine wisdom, which is the lack of hierarchy. The masculine wisdom is that, but it also needs boundaries. And, and so some people have, have started doing some crazy shit with that. And I've been like, no, here are the principles. If you want to call it a circle, it needs to have these principles. Already, don't, I, think, don't you think boundaries are both masculine and feminine in a perfect harmony? I would say uh, that is like a yin yang kind of thing. That's no, what I, what I see the feminine is blur. Is no, this? that's the it's shadow feminine. side of feminine. Uh-uh. <laughs> but that's the next podcast. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that another time. Let's, I, let's get away from the feminine masculine. I think they, they it's, not about, it's not a good terminology. It's too true. It is very. I'm. I'm. Um, yeah. I'm somatically uh, <laughs> activated right now. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Let's get back to this. I think the in in any successful um, movement, we need a container. Yes. And uh, I would call that the container is... I, this is why I think Germany is going to be the, one of the places where this does really well and launches well. I think it's no mistake you guys were the first because what I see in Germany is a, a respect for equality. Like it's a very flat culture in many ways, not like Russia, for example, very hierarchical. Mm-hmm. Like the Russians wanted me to tell them how to do it. I'm flying to Moscow to tell them how to do, not telling people how to do things. Um, it's so that's funny, but it's but the other thing I see in Germany is it's this respect for like boundaries, discipline, order, structures. So, so it's it's no surprise to me, and and this is the format that I think works because just the hippie free for all doesn't work, and an empire that's overly controlled doesn't work, and this, this is this balance of yin and yang. At least in the projects that I'm involved with, um, we we've all been around doing our thing for 20 something years and none of us have time for that shit. You know, <laughs> I, I really don't have time for that shit. If someone says I'm going to be there at eight and they show up at yes. 20, I, that just annoys me. Like, I'm busy. As I'm if busy. I have Turn other things. Call. Yeah. You know, that's, if someone's I, more than late. You know, if someone's more than 10 minutes late for one of the podcasts, you know what happens? They don't get to go on the podcast and I don't rebook them. Like, unless they've had a death in the family, that's the end of their podcast experience. Yeah, fair enough. Because, like, you know, we all have a life, right? The podcast, like <laughs> boundaries. Mm-hmm. And if somebody is going to share in the circle and I did it with a timer and I don't know, there's a part of me um, that totally contrasts my crazy curly hair. People think that I'm just a sippy dippy because of the way I look, but I think there's this inside of me and I need to have a container. I need to say... Mm-hmm. I'm willing to give you a hundred percent right now because this is what I'm willing to commit to. Yes. And are you willing to commit to this too? And if someone says, yeah, then that's our container. And so what wow. I did with the meeting and I'll do it again on the 13th when we have another circle is each person gets two minutes to say something, you know, they don't have to use the whole two the minutes bell goes and, and, bell goes and that's it. And, that's and it. that yeah. we're all there for you. We're all listening and we're being as present as we possibly yes. can in that two minutes. But, um, then the time is over and that's yeah. the talking of which Krista, unfortunately our time is up. Yeah. I wanted to give this podcast a little bit extra because I knew we'd be talking about the circles and not just, you know, your own background. I, I think we had fast. I really look forward to spending more time with you in Berlin. We're going to be dancing with Adam Barley together. I've just, Yahoo! Uh, um, we're going to have some, Adam was a part on the past podcast as well. One of the first ones. Um, so yeah, I just encourage everyone out there that's interested in circles to start Googling it. The embodiment circle will have a centralized website lifting, listing all the country circles and city circles fairly soon. And it's already on Facebook. Um, Vidi Das is working on the website now. It's free for all. Uh, it's just donation to cover any rent or gifts to the teachers that happen to be teaching. It's peer led. Uh, I think it's a, a new step in kind of the way the embodiment world's going and something that can really spread this work to people. So, um, I, you know, even though we talked about Trump and Brexit, and all this, I actually feel I'm coming out of this conference, conference feeling the most hopeful. I've felt. That's why I've got so much energy right now. People are like, have you slept in a month? I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> like, I've got loads of energy, partly the coffee, and it's partly hope. Like, like I feel hopeful. Uh, yeah, at absolutely. Least our, this- at least in our, our thing, the embodiment world, and how that can in some way influence the rest of the world. 
and this this so generous need generosity around connecting it's it's just bubbling and it's it's also giving me a lot of levitation to the heavy heaviness that's happening yes it's yeah, awesome new friends as much as anything like on the conference breakout groups new friends new hope new possibility like people are asking like why are you putting all this energy into the conference when you won't get any money out of it and I'm going, okay, one, it's just a really good thing to do. But two, I know it's going to come back to me in other ways. Like the people I'm meeting, the, the, the momentum of it just feels so positive that, um, yeah, I'm fucking glad it's happening. So yeah. glad I, I, look, I look forward to going forward and seeing what this all brings us. Okay, we have to wrap up. I always ask people where they can find out more. So Embodiment Circles you're going to find online. I think the website URL for that is... Um, embodimentcircle.com i just saw we just grabbed that url about an hour ago two hours ago so um that's there and for your personal stuff krista if people are in berlin they want to dance with you move with you do trauma work what's where do they find out more about you personally my website is probably the best or um right. on facebook radical presence and we'll be posting my um, website I absolutely will if people can go to that but let's let's write it up anyway so it's you want to spell your name? Yeah, it's a kind of difficult one. C H R I S T A C O C C I O L E dot com. If you go there, you can see the crazy hair that was made. The crazy <laughs> yeah. A beautiful <laughs> smile on the oh, front page. All gosh. sorts of resources and things there. So yeah, check it out. I've got yeah. uh, I've got that there in front of me now in English and German. Okay, Germany, by the way, is our third biggest audience for the podcast. So, hey, you and, and, and Berlin is 90% of that. <laughs> I just saw the data the other day. So, Berlin actually gets more hits than any other European country except the UK and the Netherlands, just as a city. So, it's like San Francisco gets more hits than everywhere else. So, I'm um, okay. I've got to go. Yeah, enjoy your curry. Stuff. No, I've got to interview one more person first. Oh, okay. I'm so not going to be concentrating either. Mm -hmm. Okay. This was good. I enjoyed Thanks, this. Thank you, Mister. Take care. Yeah, you take care. Bye-bye. Subscribe to get more. And you can also leave us a review on iTunes, which helps with our rankings. So really appreciate that. Um, equally, if you want to support the podcast even more, then fund us. Um, go to Patreon. Give us a dollar per episode. Um, those of you who don't know, Patreon's a really good way of supporting things you want to see more of in the world. I know like so much is available for free now and you know what I'd say is a lot of energy and effort goes into this podcast. Um, I put it out there for free so everyone can get it, you know, more than I work on this. Everyone that wants it can have it for free uh, and if you want to support us, it is really appreciated. So it's patreon.com slash Mark Walsh. And of course, if you want any in-person training, you can visit embodiedfacilitator.com. There's loads more resources there too. Till next time, welcome home to the body.